Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first research uh, talk today. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to Anders Gillen, who is going to tell us more about quantum computing and machine learning. How do they help each other? Thanks, Anders. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to this great event. Uh, this will be mostly an overview talk um, about what are the interesting things that uh, I think uh, are the machine learning these days and well in and then quantum computing together and certainly there are many many interesting things happening there so I, I might not be able to like a glimpse a light on on everything that's it, that's uh, interesting and happening right now but I, I try to like uh, uh, give a good selection of of, of things so uh, well when we talk about quantum computing and machine learning then it is actually many phases already at a high level. So um, we can talk about uh, data that's classical, but uh, uh, a means of learning which is involving a quantum computer. And this is uh, probably historically the, the one which was first studied. And, and this is basically like speeding up existing machine learning techniques using a quantum computer. Uh, but then one can ask different questions. So what if I actually have quantum data and I want, would like to apply classical machine learning to it to understand the physics better or, uh, <clears throat> or, 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 or like uh, handle um, problems that involve a lot of parameters and, and, and like hard to uh, assess otherwise and so on. And then um, there is uh, the next level when you actually have quantum data and you would like to somehow uh, process it in a quantum way. And, and this, is, uh, this has only been uh, studied more recently. And uh, I will end my talk uh, by uh, mentioning uh, an interesting result in this direction. Uh, okay, so let me start with uh, the quantum processing of classical data. And uh, this was historically the first uh, area that was studied and also is uh, probably uh, has the greatest uh, literature. So I will definitely not be able to like mention everything, but but uh, I will try to uh, walk through at least the uh, historically first examples and 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 comment on the relevance today. So um, arguably one could say that this quantum machine learning topic started with the HHL algorithm by Haro Hasidim and Lloyd in 2009 which is not directly a machine learning algorithm, but it actually uh, attempts to solve a large, a potentially exponentially large uh, linear equation system, but in a quantum, in a fundamentally quantum way. And um, because it solves the problem in a quantum way, uh, there is a potential for exponential speed up under some conditions, uh, which are the following, that uh, the input of the problem is a quantum state vector b. So the vector b, which is on the right hand side of the equation, ax equals b, should be given as a, as a quantum state. And the matrix, uh, which is involved in the description of the problem, that, uh, that has some sparsity and some condition number that are important from the perspective of the quantum algorithm. Uh, and the output, again, will be a quantum state vector just as the input was. And that should be proportional to A inverse B, the solution of AX equals B the linear equation system. <clears throat> uh, and the good thing about that this algorithm or uh, its later iterations have a running time that's about uh, the condition number times the sparsity, which is, uh, you know, could be nice. It's an easy expression at least. Um, but if, if we really want to get this exponential speed up that is uh, potentially uh, in this problem, we should have this condition number very small, uh, like polylogarithmic or something in the dimension and the sparsity as well. So this is the difficulty. And another difficulty is that the output state is not, not written down on paper or something as a, as a normal output state would be, but it's only given uh, access to as a quantum state. And uh, 
while still uh, this uh, people try to find the applications to this problem that uh, that can work with all these caveats and and somehow uh, get out interesting information uh, for, for, by, by solving this system and one of the early uh, papers that is one of the first quantum machine learning papers by Weeb, uh, Brown and Lloyd was uh, studying how to use this HH algorithm to to solve uh, some data fitting problems. And then similar algorithms can be developed along these lines for regression and so on. Uh, there were quite a few papers following up in this direction. Uh, and then, well, one other interesting technique which uh, roughly falls in this line of research is a quantum principle component analysis uh, by Lloyd, Mosani, and Raymond Trost from 2014. And uh, here the problem is that we are given uh, a density operator, a quantum state, uh, with several copies potentially, and we would like to find the top eigenvectors of these density operators. Uh, and actually, this relates to uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, when we actually get this density operator uh, from from loading data points into a quantum computer and, and producing a quantum state that way. Uh, and yeah, this application had a slight caveat that actually representing it as a quantum state this way relied on, on, on somehow loading this data into the quantum computer, which was uh, usually solved by using a, a QRAM, which is a, a RAM, a, 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 a random access memory, which can be accessed in quantum superposition. And then assuming such a device, uh, the, the authors claim some exponential speed ups. Uh, and uh, probably one of the most famous examples of, of quantum machine learning algorithms is for a recommendation systems, uh, where recommendation systems is, is a problem where we have some uh, users and, and, and some products, and uh, we have some partial information about uh, which users like which product and how much. Uh, and uh, we wish to like predict uh, unknown elements of this matrix, of this preference matrix. So uh, imagine that uh, there are millions of users of, for example, uh, an online streaming company, and they, they want to recommend the videos to their users. And they already seen, uh, the, the users have already uh, like uh, expressed their liking of, of videos that they already have seen. And based on this information, uh, the company wants to recommend uh, movies that will be likely a uh, good match for that user. And uh, the underlying assumption under which uh, uh, it's possible to to give uh, good recommendations is that uh, uh, this is somehow mostly a low rank matrix with some important principal components and then the rest of the matrix is something like a bit of a noise and under this assumption one one can hope to solve this problem efficiently and uh, in particular Kennedy's and Prakash showed in 2016 that uh, that these quantum linear algebra techniques that I, I showcased so far can be tweaked to to solve this problem very efficiently with the promised exponential speed up. So that was very thrilling, and and indeed people were super excited that this might be the first uh, uh, killer application of quantum machine learning where you get exponential speed up for a practically relevant problem. So that was the stage in 2016 and 17. And then something happened. Uh, a, a teenager came called Evin Tang and uh, produced and, and, and put two, three, three papers to archive uh, in the second half of 2018. And the quantum recommendation system fall, just as quantum PCA and low rank HHL. In, in the sense that it was shown that under the assumptions that are used by the quantum algorithm, actually, a classical algorithm can somewhat mimic this uh, quantum algorithm, but in a, in a completely classical way. 
Uh, and so this really uh, uh, state uh, implied that there are no exponential speedups for these, these two problems, uh, mostly the problems that I showcased so far. Uh, but it, it's not the end of the story. Uh, it just tells us that we need to be more careful. Um, and still there are some, uh, some algorithms in, in this quantum linear algebra regime where we don't know if, if, uh, if a polynomial time classical algorithm can be. And these are problems where somehow the matrices that are involved are not approximately low rank, but they are truly high rank matrices. And such examples include a topological data analysis, Gaussian process regression, and learning with random features, to, to name uh, some of the most interesting uh, proposals in this direction. But uh, despite the fact, actually, that, uh, that for the aforementioned uh, problems, uh, there seems to be no exponential speed up, it doesn't mean that those problems uh, are actually not uh, 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 that, that we should like lose all hope for gaining some interesting improvement using quantum machine learning for these problems. And this may, may be uh, a bit like uh, uh, less uh, studied or, or I don't know how to say. So I think that, that people were initially super excited when they saw that they are exponential speed up for these problems uh, potentially. And then when it was shown that there is no exponential speed up, then they said, well, OK, maybe let's move on. Uh, but I think it's uh, maybe too too early to, to like give up on these applications, especially if one looks at how the best quantum algorithms perform for these problems versus what these uh, quantum inspired classical algorithms, uh, what can they achieve in terms of performance? And they are very, very far away. So I just. Uh, listed the rough uh, uh, complexities for the best quantum algorithms and, uh, and the best uh, quantum inspired classical algorithms and, and uh, with the comparable uh, like uh, parameters uh, appearing. And I don't want to go into details about these uh, complexities, but I just want to point out that, that if, if one just looks at these complexities, then usually something like uh, uh, a four to six fold uh, polynomial uh, speed up uh, is still present. So that actually, if, if this is really such a huge improvement, I think it would be a very interesting application of, of quantum computers. However, one should note that, that these problems that are studied here and the quantum computer can solve are usually not exactly the versions of these problems that that people would like to solve in, uh, in, in machine learning, in classical machine learning, but some variants uh, uh, of them uh, with some limitations that are, you know, are, are uh, stemming from these uh, assumptions and, and structure of these, of these quantum linear algebra algorithms. So if, if these were uh, really problems that, that would be directly relevant to classical machine learning, then this even these like polynomial speedups, which are like power of six or something, that would be amazing. Uh, I, I would say more the problem is that that these uh, version of the problems that this quantum algorithm can solve are often not not the best versions of these of these solutions, and and that's where we need to work a bit more. But even though there are no uh, exponential speedups for these applications, I I still think that this can be potentially important in the future. Uh, okay, and uh, while there are really many more examples of these uh, quantum techniques applied to classical machine learning methods for speeding them up, and I really don't have time to go into all these uh, other examples because there are, are just too many of them to, to name in this short talk, but uh, they are like quantum Boltzmann machines and then some techniques for speeding up Bayesian methods and also support vector machines and kernel methods. So there are many more uh, attempts in these directions. I just want to point you to the uh, related talk of Veldran at uh, 11.45 today, who will talk about quantum machine learning beyond quantum kernels and with smaller circuits. 
and that falls into roughly this line of, of research. Uh, and another important class that I still want to talk about is, uh, is about uh, quantum neural networks or more generally uh, parametrized quantum circuits. And, uh, and the variants thereof, which are like quantum variation elegance solvers for, for finding ground states of physical systems and so on. And here, the main idea is that uh, people try to like mimic somehow the structure of neural networks but with a quantum circuit and uh, as opposed to neurons which have some like uh, tunable activation levels and and and, and the like we would have a, a, a network of unitary gates and and some of these unitary gates maybe one or two qubit gates would be parameterized by some parameter and and we hope that uh, that this circuit if, if we choose the right parameters solve some some interesting problem and and we can optimize this uh, yeah by some measure which which maybe like represents uh, how well this circuit represents the data or how well it predicts some function uh, some outcome on, on different data points or 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 anything like that and uh, and people uh, use this general team for attacking uh, similar problems uh, and uh, and such uh, uh, parameterized circuits, just like neural networks, are usually tuned using uh, some gradient descent methods. Uh, but there are some uh, caveats uh, in this in this unitary circuit formalism, which make it uh, more difficult in practice. Uh, and one thing is that evaluating the gradient of of such a complicated quantum circuit high precision can be costly and also the gradients can be very small at most places throughout the landscape uh, which is something called the barren plateau uh, and again uh, I don't have time to details uh, about this but I'm glad to point out uh, a potential fix for this barren plateau problem uh, by Maria who is going to talk about uh, training quantum uh, neural networks uh, with unbounded loss function uh, at three o'clock. So I encourage you to uh, attend her talk if you are interested in more details in this direction. All right, so let me move to, to the next uh, section, which is about the next part of my talk, which is about classical processing of quantum data. And uh, so here, uh, let me start with the easiest example, <coughs> which is uh, learning quantum states. So one task can be just uh, full, full quantum state tomography when we are given copies of a density operator and we can request more and more samples and we wish to determine uh, roughly the density, the density operator to some precision, say epsilon in the trace norm. And this problem is well studied by now and it, we know uh, the optimal sample complexity, which is something like uh, the dimension times the rank of the density operator divided by epsilon square. Uh, however, uh, the dimension dependence quickly becomes prohibitive if we have, you know, more than a few dozens of qubits. So full quantum state tomography on, on, on large dimensional systems is not something that we, we would like to do. Uh, so people studied uh, more limited versions where maybe we don't want to rec reconstruct the entire uh, density operator, but what is relevant for us is, is some measurement outcomes. And uh, Scott Aronson showed uh, how to uh, learn only these measurement outcomes with some very nicely scaling number of, of, of samples, which is, and this is called shadow tomography which is unfortunately uh, not computationally efficient, but, uh, but gives you nice complexity, which does not depend linearly, but only logarithmically in the dim dimension of the system, which is great news. And uh, people were really excited about this result. So <clears throat> they tried to uh, develop versions of this uh, for, for uh, which would be computationally efficient, 
and and works for some physically relevant set of observables and and Huang, Kung and Preskill in 2020 uh, showed uh, introduced the classical shadow uh, formalism uh, which is uh, tackling this problem uh, and uh, actually building on this classical shadow formalism and, and in, including more directions, uh, these authors also uh, try to find advantage uh, of classical learning, machine learning algorithms for predicting properties of quantum states, which is, I think, a very interesting direction. And they have some provable guarantees here, which is amazing. So they studied uh, what how can how well can a, quant, a classical machine learning algorithm perform when it's, it's presented some uh, examples from from the ground state of, of a parameterized family of, of physical Hamiltonians so we have a large parameter space and we can only take a few samples of it and and then get some ground state information and we would like to predict the behavior of the ground state and different parts of the of the state space and and they these authors showed uh, a provable advantage for machine learning algorithms that can uh, get some samples and process it and then predict uh, these ground state properties and these provably outperform under some might complexity theoretical assumptions they outperform the best classical algorithms and then similar uh, application that they show is classifying phases of matter uh, and, and again, the authors can show that uh, that actually a classical machine learning algorithm that can request samples from from these physical uh, states can actually provably outperform any classical algorithm. Uh, and uh, one more example of of this learning uh, of such a learning problem, uh, I would like to bring here the learning uh, of, of local Hamiltonians from Gibbs states. So here the problem would be that we are given some geometrically local Hamiltonian <clears throat> and which is unknown to us. Maybe, you know, like a physicist in the lab and uh, wants to figure out what is the actual Hamiltonian of the system and uh, wh what we are assuming access to is a thermal states or Gibbs states of this physical system and where the thermal states are described by this Hamiltonian. And, uh, and last year, uh, Anshu, Arunachalam, Kuvahara, and Solem Iman Manfar uh, showed that in any constant dimensional space, an n qubit geometric local Hamiltonian can be learned to L, to, uh, L infinity error uh, with this uh, following complexity, which is. Uh, you know, uh, for high temperatures, it's uh, it's polynomial in, in beta and the number of qubits and the precision that you want. For low temperature, things become more complicated, but that is to be expected. That is to be expected. And and what do I mean by L, L infinite error? That uh, basically the, the coefficients of the local terms in this Hamiltonian, we assume that we know what are the possible interaction terms, the local geometric local interaction terms, and we wish to, to find with what uh, coefficient each term is present. And the error that we can make in each coefficient is at most epsilon. That is the problem that they studied. Uh, and this was mostly about sample complexity, although for uh, high enough temperatures, the algorithm also gave rise to something computational efficient. But this was even further improved uh, for supercritical temperatures under some additional assumptions by Ha, Kotari, and Tang uh, also last year. And, and they got an even nicer complexity here. OK, so these are just some, some very interesting results about uh, using machine learning techniques applied to quantum physics, where we have some provable guarantees. And finally, I just want to, to show you one slide about uh, the quantum processing of quantum data, which can be maybe the future of quantum experiments uh, by uh, enhanced by a coherent memory. So 
a similar uh, questions were studied uh, by two groups uh, last year and uh, and they, they studied this setting exactly and Aharonov, Kotler and Kvi uh, proved an exponential advantage for the following problem uh, which is vaguely motivated by uh, by learning if a system has a Hamiltonian which is time independent or time dependent and and they assume that we have access to a black box which is some equipment in the lab or some quantum system that we wish to understand or a model of that and uh, this black box is either applying uh, a different hard random and qubit unitary it, at each use uh, always a different a fresh uh, hard random new one or it applies a hard random unitary which is fixed throughout all uses uh, whenever we use this black box and the task would be to distinguish two, these two cases uh, and there is a very nice advantage here uh, if we can store n qubits between the two uses of the box they show that a few uses of the black box suffices to tell apart the two cases using a very uh, easy protocol the swap test and uh, they also show <clears throat> that on the other hand <clears throat> if we cannot maintain coherence between the two subsequent uses so we don't have a coherent memory between the uses of the black, black box then an exponential number of uses are required <clears throat> so it shows that if we can somehow use a quantum computer in the lab to distinguish to learn about this system then we can be exponentially more efficient in discovering this feature of, 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 of this piece of nature this black box that we have at hand than if we don't so it shows that quantum computer compute quantum computers can even speed up the the discovery of of quantum physics which is i think a very interesting direction it only has been uh, studied recently but I, I i'm expecting more results in this direction and thank you uh, i'm awaiting questions now thanks very much uh, andras we have a couple of questions we are a little bit late so if you can try to answer very quickly thanks so we have a question from adam except of ba Baron Plateau, why gradient is costly to evaluate? Uh, <clears throat> so in, in classical neural networks, there is a, a very good uh, uh, method for evaluating gradients, <clears throat> which is back, back propagation. Uh, and this is possible because we understand the states of and layers of the neural network at every, every stage, and we can just, as we similarly as we can compute the value of a neural network we can also compute its gradient essentially the same way <clears throat> however uh, in a quantum circuit these amplitudes are present and quantum physics is computing as the value of this circuit at the end so we cannot really like go there and step by step understand all the amplitudes it just happening as a black box and we can't really open it unless we simulate the entire system but you know for a large quantum system we can't simulate it so we need to somehow make measurements and, and prepare some statistics and, and uh, we can only learn about these gradients using some statistical means uh, for very large systems and that's that's the fundamental difference thanks and a question from noxana is there any hint that neurons or information running on them may have some quantum effects by nature well uh okay i i would say that that uh this is a speculative um thing at the moment uh and you know there are some serious scientists who think that maybe even some quantum gravity effects play a role i think roger penrose has some ideas about this but uh i think that we are not not near the stage that we can actually like uh you know scientifically uh, as this uh, answer this question by means of some experiments we are just very far away from 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 saying whether it might be true or not uh i think i think it's too early to 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 say something thanks a lot can be done still in terms of fundamental science here thanks a lot andras uh, it was a pleasure to have you here uh, have a good day i hope you enjoyed it thank, thank you see you